Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. And I am here with uh, no stranger to this show, Mr. Joshua Cutchin. Hello, Josh. Hello, Soraya. Long time no speak. Yeah, we'll get to that. <laughs> the uh, man. So we actually recorded this interview already, and uh, the recording software did something I can't even explain. So we're re-recording this interview. <laughs> Um, hopefully it'll be better the second time around, but uh, I am going to include a clip here in a moment of exactly what it was doing, because it's the weirdest thing I've ever heard. Right here. Important revelation in this book. Oh, wow. I, I, um, I appreciate it. You know, this is sort of, this is sort of my MO. Yeah, so uh, apparently it decided to play music while we were, while we were talking. Yeah, I have never heard anything like that in my life. That's 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 really unique. <laughs> I had one interview in the past, and actually, I haven't even posted it yet. I keep meaning to post it, and I, I keep delaying to do that. Uh, where I had a popping noise through the whole interview. That wasn't so weird, and I was able to filter that out, so you can't even tell it was there, and everything was there. But this is actually uh, everything we said is there. It's just that it every once in a while stopped, and for a split second, put a tone in. Yeah, and what's striking to me is that it's not the same sound every time. Like it's always constantly changing pitch, and uh, that's a weird one. That's 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 a that's a new one for me. Yeah, it's uh... <laughs> all right. It's us. What do you want? <laughs> Probably. Anyway, finally, your new book, The Brimstone Deceit, is out, and it's subtitled An In-Depth Examination of Supernatural Sense, Otherworldly Odors, and Monstrous Miasmas. Yeah, I was really happy to, to get that subtitle in there um, because what it does is it really sort of lays out the three main sections of the book, which are, you know, supernatural sense, so the sense of uh, the smells of the spirit world, otherworldly odors, smells from UFOs and alien abduction, and uh, monstrous miasmas, which uh, goes into, obviously, Bigfoot or Sasquatch. But uh, this was this was fun because not only did I get to write about those things, but... One of the one of the later chapters in the book goes into all sorts of stuff like lake monsters and dog man and black eyed children and uh, black eyed kids rather um, and men in black and fairies so a lot of stuff that I don't usually get to write about uh, I was able to include uh, because there are plenty of cases where those things smell too in the paranormal literature <laughs> and uh, this is done very differently from your first book which was on uh, taste essentially the food of the uh, paranormal. And, I mean, although the, it seems like they'd be similar, and they are, I guess, in certain ways, this takes a very different uh, tact with it. Um, I believe you told me that you feel it's more scientific than, say, folklore-ish, like the first one. Yeah, I think the the central piece of information that informs a Trojan feast is really just the folkloric a aspect, the folkloric angle. Um, but for this, one of the centerpieces that really ties it together is the science of olfaction, the science of, of smell. Um, and it's something that uh, it's sort of, uh, <laughs> it's the stitching that holds the whole book together, I think. Hmm. And um, I didn't realize how little we know about smell. I mean, we understand to some degree how sight works. We understand to some degree how taste and hearing work, but... The science of smell is really um, still a bit of a mystery, and there's some really weird stuff going on with it. Yeah, it's up in the air. Um, we, we don't really have a great grasp on exactly how it works. Um, the prevailing theory is that there's some sort of key lock configuration in our noses where each cell corresponds to a specific uh, molecule. And if a key, you know, the molecule, and the lock, the actual sense cell, are compatible, there's a certain stimulation that's related to the olfactory bulb and... Uh, ends up, you know, having a, a electrical impulses fired at the amygdala, amygdala, which is sort of the ground zero for memory and emotions and decision making. Um, but other people have posited that there's some sort of quantum level at which uh, smell functions, uh, which is definitely not something you would expect. You know, you, you think that we have these sort of things figured out, but no, uh, smell is, um, is actually kind of mysterious. And in a lot of ways, smell is a great uh, metaphor for the paranormal because not only do we not know how it works, but, you know, uh, 
a lot of times you'll smell something, but you can't see it. It's invisible, but you know that it's there. You're able to detect it. So it's it's a lot like uh, it's a lot like the paranormal in a way. You know, the smells are invisible, but they influence our lives. And I think that you could make a similar uh, argument for uh, supernatural forces. True. True. Um, yeah, it, it's it's. It's almost weird how scent has even come about. I mean, because you talk about the uh, how negative smells affect us more than positive smells and uh, how their effect on memory as well. Right. Um, it's 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 very much tied into memory. Um, for example, there's some research that's coming out nowadays that suggests that a an impairment of smell is one of the early signs of uh, of Alzheimer's disease. Um, and so some speculation is, is that this is because smell is tied into our involuntary memory. I mean, anyone who has uh, smelled the perfume of you know, a, a previous lover or the cologne of a previous lover knows that if they smell that again, they immediately have memories that just come up unbidden uh, right into their, into their mind's eye. You know, it's, 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 we can't control it. It's involuntary and it's instantaneous, um, which I think you know, raises some interesting questions in the, in the paranormal uh, perspective because it uh it seems like it would be a sense that would be very much ripe for deception true true or control right yeah or some it could be implemented to some end i think is, is a really good way to put it i mean i'm assuming that's part of where the the title comes from the brimstone deceit it does you know it's, it's kind of funny i was i was uh, talking with uh, greg bishop about this and um it kind of sounds like it might be like an evangelical Christian book, like, <laughs> or 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 Dan Brown's the the uh, Brimstone Deceit or something. Right, um, right. Yeah, uh, but it's it's not really about that. It's it's more about like the uh, the manner in which uh, sulfur is is one of the most common smells in all uh, supernatural phenomena. Um, common in the sense not that it necessarily represents the majority of smells, but I would definitely say that it represents a plurality of smells. So if it's not 51 or more percent of paranormal encounters that involve the smell of brimstone, it's still probably the largest chunk of single smells are sulfurous smells. And, uh, talk a little bit about the history of sulfur and and the idea of sulfur because it's not some people think something smells sulfuric and it might actually not be sulfur per se right so pure sulfur actually doesn't have a smell um it will smell when it is burnt and it generates a compound called, known as a uh, sulfur dioxide um but a lot of times when people say that they're smelling sulfur they're actually smelling one of several uh, sulfur compounds. Uh, the mo two most common, especially in paranormal cases, are uh, sulfur dioxide, which is the smell of fireworks or burnt matches, um, and hydrogen sulfide, which we all recognize as the uh, rotten egg odor. Um, hydrogen sulfide is one of the uh, primary malodorous components in, in intestinal gas. Um, and it occurs whenever you have uh, anaerobic uh, decomposition. So decomposition in the absence of oxygen. That's why we have that characteristic rotten egg odor. Um, but it's interesting because sulfur itself was long used as a fumigant and as a an antimicrobial agent uh, all the way back into you know, classical Greece, um, which is why it's interesting when you take a look at uh, sort of the Judeo-Christian uh, tradition. A lot of uh, early Hebrew texts would refer to God's cleansing breath as being like sulfur. And so put in, put in this perspective, we gain some additional insight onto why demonic forces and Satan are often said to smell like brimstone. Not because the devil loves the fact that he got thrown into a lake of fire and brimstone, but that fire and brimstone actually represents more of uh, the, the divine's attempt to cleanse the devil of evil. So it's not, uh, it's not necessarily that they're just evil and they happen to smell stinky. It's actually part of that continuum of uh, part of that longstanding tradition of using sulfur to cleanse. Hmm. Now you also, if I'm not mistaken, you said something about sulfur often gets uh, mistaken with ozone, doesn't it? Yeah. So there's, um, you, you'll find a lot of, um, a lot of conflation between sulfur and ozone. Um, 
in antiquity, they used to basically use the terms interchangeably. They would say that uh, lightning would 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 uh, you know race to the ground and leave behind a smell of sulfur in its wake. That's not correct. That smell is ozone. Um, but this is a uh, a a series of confusing interpretations that uh, continued until relatively recently. I mean, even Ben Franklin was saying similar things. Um, so. In a historical context, this has brought up a lot of questions about whether or not UFO witnesses in particular are noticing sulfur or ozone. Um, there have been some researchers in the past who claim that witnesses are always mistaking uh, uh, ozone for sulfur, but I have a couple of problems with that. Number one, I found a lot of uh, very specific sightings where people claim to notice a firework smell or a rotten egg smell. So that runs directly contra contradictory to that. But number two, if you're going to call into question what the witness smelled and whether or not they recognized it, we might as well start questioning everything about their testimony. Um, so I really don't buy the idea that uh, that pe people, especially in UFO encounters, are smelling uh, ozone and thinking that it's sulfur. I just don't really buy that. Uh, again, like I said, I have plenty of cases where people explicitly refer to a sulfur or a rotten egg smell, um, which is not at all the way anyone would qualify ozone. Hmm. Yeah, I wouldn't think so. I actually kind of like the smell of ozone. Well, you know, ozone is, um, ozone is often used uh, to disinfect like water sources and whatnot, which is why I think it's interesting that uh, ozone sometimes appears after exorcisms. It's almost like the act of cleansing the evil from the uh, from the possessed individual leaves behind this sort of ozone scent. You'll find that uh, in post-exorcism scenarios. You'll also find it um, in seances. Apparently, ectoplasm, whenever it manifests, uh, has been reported to have a smell of ozone attached to it. Hmm. You uh. How did you find all these accounts? You obviously, I mean, you have, I think we said over 600 uh, uh, footnotes, you yes, know, reference yeah. notes. And well, I, I, I know, I'm pretty sure you haven't read the number of books that you reference in this in this book. No, it's 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 actually like 660 uh, sources, but like about a thousand uh, end notes in the book. Um, yeah, the last hundred pages are all bibliography and end notes and, and uh, index. Um, so, I have um, I own about between eighty and one hundred uh, fourteen books myself, so obviously I went through those. Um, but I also had some other resources. Um, Albert Rosales has recently taken down off the internet his uh, his humanoid sighting reports, but uh, uh, those at one point were available until relatively recently in PDF format. Uh, thousands, like tens of thousands, of reports of different entities, and uh, it was. Extremely helpful to have those in that format because it allowed me to come up with search terms, um, you know, probably about 15 different search terms that I used to sort of try to uh, to make that streamline that process a little bit. And from there, you could see where, you know, he said that the source was for this particular encounter and you could go track it down um, for someone like me. Um, I like to, I like to pinpoint individual pages. I like to see it <laughs> for myself. So right. I had to, I had to sort of track some stuff down and Google books was helpful in that regard. Um, I'm fortunate enough to be within very close driving distance, relatively speaking of my, uh, of my alma mater, uh, so that I was able to utilize their interlibrary loan. Um, so that was all quite helpful. And I was also able to find uh, some digitized versions of old, uh, MUFON journal and old, uh, flying saucer review, editions so basically going through those again with a fine tooth comb and trying to pick out every case that involves a smell or you know a whiff or a scent <laughs> you know all these search terms i had to come up with um so that was where the lion's share of the process started and, you know i would talk about the the sort of thing and people would send me uh people would send me leads as well uh that that's that's finally starting to happen in my career so yeah it's um it's uh, a lot of different a lot of different methods to get to the to the uh, core core cases in this book. And uh, why did he take all his uh, humanoid reports offline? Do you know? Uh, he started publishing them. Uh, oh. he's, he's partnering with somebody, and they're sort of taking out the the jewels of uh, his his humanoid reports and putting them into a book, which is great. And I'm, I'm you know kudos to him for that. The reason that I limit that is because 
his his citing database was like everything that was ever written. Like it was obscure cases. It was you know the the big high profile cases. Like you could find pretty much everything in those in those uh, those the compilation of reports. So um, good for him, bad for us, I guess. <laughs> um, and how long did it take you to put all this together? Um, you know, if I reflect on it, uh, I think I was, I had started writing this or I started, you know, doing the research and everything in around August of, of, uh, last year, August of 2015. And I had a first draft completed, uh, by April. So, and then I just, you know, different, uh, revisions and sort of sitting on it and trying to get it through the publication process uh, brought us up to, you know, just this past, uh, just about two weeks ago. Wow. Um, you did that fairly quick, actually, for the amount of data, that the denseness of the data in this book. <laughs> well, I tried to have, uh, tried to have everything planned out, uh, nice and clearly. Um, so that once I started writing, I could just dive right in. But, uh, yeah, I guess you're right. Like look, looking back on this is a lot of this is a lot of information. Um all right, so what did you find were the most common smells besides sulfur? So you find this uh well, I'll go ahead and answer the sulfur part too, if that's all right. Um sure. so within sulfur, it's generally people saying sulfur, it seems like the most common uh compound that people would report would be hydrogen sulfide, uh, the rotten egg smell, and uh, sulfur dioxide, which is the fireworks smell, like the gunpowder smell. Um, but beyond that, uh, some common ones that you notice, um, I, mentioned, I mentioned ozone, but that's almost exclusive to alien abduction lore. Um, ammonia was one that cropped up, especially between Bigfoot and, uh, and UFOs. Um, in spirit sightings or spirit ghost, ghost uh, encounters, people often smelled uh, smoke, tobacco smoke, or some sort of perfume, um, almost always associated with uh, men and women, uh, re respectively. And in Bigfoot, you find a lot of cases of uh, smells of uh, wet dog. Um, decay is actually common to all three all three different uh, groups: spirits, UFOs, and Bigfoot. Um, and uh, and then you know then you'll have some little outliers here and there. I mean one of my one of my favorite, extremely evocative, uh, descriptions in the book, just because it's so disgusting, is a guy uh, from Idaho who claimed to have seen a Bigfoot, and he said that the smell reminded him of when he was a young boy, and he would find a, uh, a lamb that had given birth to a. a dead lamb fetus and that was the same smell this bigfoot smelled like which is like the most simultaneously fascinating and disgusting and evocative description i've ever i've ever i've ever read yeah that's uh i don't know that anyone would really know what that smells like no but i can imagine it. i don't like it. <laughs> i don't <laughs> like it at all bad we'll go with bad yeah i think i think probably not what you want to smell right before dinner that's for sure um, now, with the spirit smells, you noted something kind of interesting with the uh, the scent of smoke and such, and male and female ghosts. Yeah, so a lot of my interests uh, nowadays are uh, into the role that the witness plays in these particular encounters. Um, as my good friend Greg Bishop is fond of saying, like, what do we bring to the dance? You know, how much of what we see or what we witness in one way or another is our preconceived notions and our assumptions and, uh, and you know, what, what we have kicking around in our own noggins, as it were. Um, I find it really interesting that every time someone smells uh, tobacco smoke in a ghost encounter, they assume it's a man. And every time they smell perfume they assume it's a woman even though women smoked just as much as men in years past and uh, men have been using cologne since antiquity so it's really interesting to me that w almost without exception there are a couple cases that i found to, to the contrary but almost without exception these assumptions are made and uh i think it really says a lot about the way that we interpret paranormal experiences and paranormal interactions it it, it it makes you wonder if the ghost is formed around those expectations and even stays that way over time. Yeah, that's a perfect example uh, of of how this you know 
of how we could be interacting with that. Something else that I find interesting is, so these phenomena, spirits, UFOs, Bigfoot, seem to be in control of the situation. They don't get caught on videotape. They don't, um, they don't get caught with their proverbial pants down, as it were. <laughs> so we we have to assume to a certain degree, especially with the UFO phenomena, that everything is chosen for a deliberate reason. Um, that's part of the controlled uh, scenario as well. So if we have certain expectations like that, it seems to me that we could be very easily manipulated by the specific selection of certain sense um, in any of these categories. Not saying that they're, they each have their own... Uh, the same level of autonomy, you know, I don't think that Sasquatch can choose sense probably as well as something like the UFO phenomena, but um, it seems like it would be very easy to manipulate the way that paranormal phenomena present themselves to us by capitalizing on how, uh, how sensitive we are to, to smell and how we make certain assumptions. The, uh the spirits you got a you got a uh, a selection of smells both positive and negative right um yeah it, with uh so you the number of pleasant smelling sasquatch encounters is practically zero <laughs> yeah. um, <laughs> the uh the number of pleasant smelling alien encounters are a little bit more common um you'll run into people of the contactee variety who like Orfeo Angelucci, who reported uh, entities that smelled like flowers, um, not at all dissimilar to the way that the blessed Virgin Mary apparitions are described. Um, but ghost, uh, ghost encounters much more often include these pleasant smells, um, often of a floral variety, often uh, a perfume or something. Um, especially in the case of the BVM apparitions, um, almost every single Blessed Virgin Mary apparition has some sort of floral odor associated with it. And beyond that, you run into a lot of tales of people smelling uh, certain types of perfumes. Lilac, lavender, jasmine is a really common uh, smell that's reported in ghost encounters as well. And uh, Bigfoot, of course, is just very smelly. Bigfoot is stinky, apparently. <laughs> um, yeah, so you'll, you'll again, these Bigfoot smells really do run the gamut. Um, you have... Wet dog smells, fecal smells, decomposition smells, um, ammonia smells, um, basically smells of entropy when you really think about it. Um, but a sizable chunk is this hydrogen sulfide rotten egg smell. Um, and then some, some people you know, just say it smelled like sulfur, which I think most of us associate sulfur with that rotten egg odor. Right, right. And with UFOs, you got a mix of stuff, but more... Aside from the contactees, you get more negative smells than positive. Yes. Yeah. Um, some of the most common UFO smells are, again, so, uh, you know, sulfur smells like hydrogen sulfide, sulfur dioxide, that fireworks or gunpowder smell is, is uh, a little bit more common to UFO lore. Um, but also ozone uh, is, is – there, there are some – there are some cases where it is very apparent either people specifically say ozone or they say something that is evocative of ozone, like a peppery smell or a, uh, a piney smell. Um, and then chemical smells like uh, medicinal odors like camphor or, uh, or disinfectant type odors and uh, burning odors also. It's another, it's another common theme that you see in a lot of this different literature. Now with the UFO and Bigfoot uh, smells, it, it, sort of lends credence to the nuts and bolts, flesh and blood sort of thing to some degree. Yes. I mean, absolutely. I, I think that, um, you know, my, my last book, A Trojan Feast, was, I think, very critical of the extraterrestrial hypothesis and and uh, not very critical of um, – of the biological Bigfoot hypothesis. This book is, is a, is a reverse. So I, I actually entertain the ETH a little bit more in this book than I did in Trojan Feast. And I'm actually a little bit more uh, in support of a supernatural Bigfoot angle uh, in this, in this book as well. But uh, yeah, certain, I mean, there are certain researchers who will tell you that um, uh, hydrocarbons like benzene and whatnot are another, uh, another common UFO smell. I don't think the literature quite bears that out, but it definitely seems to 
there definitely seems to be more mechanical odors that you run into with uh, with UFO encounters. Um, what's interesting to me is that space actually has a smell, and moon dust actually has a smell as well. And they're often compared to sulfur. So that again, that's another like little tick mark in favor of the ETH. Uh, again, I'm not an ETH guy. I think anybody who listens to this podcast realizes that realizes that. But uh, but yeah, it, it it does lend a little bit more credence to that philosophy. And of course, with Bigfoot, you have a potential of a physical flesh and blood creature, or possibly something paranormal. Um, you know what? We'll get into that in a little bit about the differences. But um, let's look at um, let's look at one of these sightings. Um, right. In 1908, you had the Alma, Colorado sighting, which was really fascinating in its perceptions. Yeah, this is actually a perfect um, example of this sort of. Interpretate witness interpretation issue that I mentioned earlier. Um, around midnight one evening in 1908, um, people who were exiting the saloons in this small Colorado town uh, saw this apparition in the street, and about half the witnesses described it as a beautiful woman uh, clad in like a white nightgown, I believe, and uh, wherever she disappeared, they actually said that they could smell perfume and roses and violets and really pleasant smells and then half the other people who said who saw it said that it looked like some sort of huge elephant creature with fire coming out of its trunk and accompanied by the smell of sulfur and uh and uh you know burning sulfur so two descriptions that are probably about as disparate as they as they could possibly get yeah um and i don't think i mean obviously the time frame would lend itself to the possibility of a newspaper hoax. But I think that conceptually that's selling this idea a little bit short because, um, you know, I, I think that's sort of an odd, that, that would be sort of an odd angle to take with a newspaper hoax. I don't know why you'd have half the people seeing something different or smelling, you know, seeing and smelling something so different. So I wonder if perhaps there's not some sort of level of manipulation uh, at play there in a case like that. Well, I also wonder like, if people are seeing something their brains can't comprehend, and for some reason some people's brains jump to the elephant idea with the flames and everything else, and then their brain says, well, that would smell bad. And then they put that smell on it, whereas other people, you know, see this thing they can't understand and they postulate it's a woman. Their brain just goes, oh, it's, a, it's a ghost woman. And she smells nice, you know. Yeah, I think that's a I think that's a very astute point, and I think that's that really is sort of getting to the heart of a lot of these matters. I mean, because either I mean, the elephant is just a ridiculous type of thing for anyone to see, but they saw it, and then you know, is the smell there in the first place, or is the smell, or is there a smell, but that what they perceive as the smell is being guided by what their their brain is putting on it, the face their brain is putting on it. Right, and a lot of times we have difficulty really uh, pinning down what smells are. Are like I mean, the, the, uh, olfactory researchers actually call this the tip of the nose phenomena, and uh, sometimes we have a difficulty placing things. I mean, a, a fun sort of a, a fun um, bit of of an experiment if you want to do it with somebody is to blindfold someone and hold a piece of Parmesan cheese under their nose and <laughs> do this to two different people. Tell one of them that you're making Italian and they'll be really happy. Tell another one that someone vomited. <laughs> and they're gonna, you know, they're gonna pull away in revulsion. So it's it's not as cut and dry. I mean, context does play a very strong role in how we interpret uh, sense. Hmm. Um, get into a little bit of uh, what Stan Gordon was researching in 1973. Now you mentioned Stan Gordon a bunch of times in the book, but this 1973 bit was uh, also interesting in the way that it kind of juxtaposed different things together. Yeah, for somebody like me, I mean, I, I feel that these phenomena, I feel like it's becoming harder and harder to argue that all paranormal or a majority of paranormal phenomena are not connected in some manner. Now, I'm not saying that it's all the same thing, but I think at the very least there is a strong likelihood that similar techniques are used between these different phenomena. We can't, we can't uh, partition these off like we used to. Uh, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. Um, so with that in mind, someone like Stan Gordon really is uh, quite appealing to me. 
Um, because Stan Gordon's seminal book, Silent Invasion, actually detailed uh, the flap in the 70s in Pennsylvania where uh, Sasquatch was seen in close proximity to uh, UFO sightings. And this particular case was no exception. Um, one evening in late October of 1973, uh, Farmhouse in Pennsylvania uh, was the site where a large, uh, about 100-foot uh, hundred foot red sphere dipped into uh, into a pasture. And some witnesses actually grabbed their, their rifles and went to uh, investigate more closely and discovered that there were these two tall, like eight-foot tall, uh, hairy ape men walking towards them. And they fired upon these ape men, um, which uh, not, not only did the uh, did the eight men seem unaffected by the by the bullets and ended up just walking into the tree line, but uh, the giant sphere, the UFO, as it were, disappeared. Um, testimony from police officers later said that it was the uh, that area where the the UFO had landed actually ended up uh, having a strong enough. Uh, light to it that they could actually read the newspaper for hours afterwards. So the uh, people in the farmhouse reached out to Stan Gordon's research group and uh, Gordon and his team arrived and began interviewing one of the witnesses. And after some time, they noticed the smell of rotten eggs in the room and the, uh, the witness begins to act agitated and actually attacks one of Gordon's team members and raving like a lunatic runs out the front door and into the landing site and passes out. And when they are actually able to wake him up, he says that he had seen visions of the apocalypse and uh, that uh, he had seen some sort of spectral, uh, spectral grim reaper type figure. So here you have something that not only comp uh, includes the the scent of sulfur, the scent of hydrogen sulfide, rotten eggs, but it also includes what we would traditionally consider UFO activity, what we would consider Bigfoot activity, and what we would consider what sounds a lot like a demonic possession. So it's sort of a, a tidy little bow for all three of these uh, three of these phenomena in one case. And if you. Uh... If you look at it, of course, there will be some people who are going to isolate out those different things. But um, it's also a possibility that some of this element of the paranormal is mimicking something that is simply unknown at this point that isn't necessarily paranormal. Um, like, I mean, you saw ape-like creatures, but those may not have been flesh and blood Bigfoot encounters, and especially with the way that they were shot at and had no response. At the same time, there may also be flesh and blood Bigfoot out there, big feet. Yeah, exactly. Um, that we just simply haven't been able to prove the existence of. And it seems like, you know, like if you talk to someone like Lyle Blackburn, he's going to tell you that he's never encountered any paranormal encounters uh, in relation to Bigfoots. Uh, but obviously you have cases like this where that's, that's a prime sort of thing there. What has the, you're studying the smell of them kind of said to you? Well, you know, I think with somebody like Lyle, and I think the world of Lyle's work, um, but I feel like you look at you look at the way that certain UFO uh, alien abduction researchers tend to attract cases that reinforce their viewpoints. Um, I think that maybe something similar happens with a lot of Bigfoot researchers, where they just tend to attract the more mundane uh, Sasquatch sightings. If any, <laughs> if a Sasquatch sighting can be mundane. Um, but uh, yeah, so it, it it appears to me if we're like sort of making some large sweeping statements um, that you will find the sulfurous odor uh, attached to Bigfoot sightings when they are either seen in conjunction with a UFO or have some sort of high strangeness associated with them. And by that I mean they disappear or they have glowing eyes that send out like little, uh, little, you know, ray, be uh, ray beams, you know, <laughs> uh, really strange stuff. And when you see the more animalistic, uh, Bigfoot smells, they usually tend to like, you know, uh, wet dog or ammonia or fecal smells or something. They tend to be associated with sightings that are more mundane that don't necessarily have all this other high strangeness around it. So that, not only suggests to me that uh, perhaps smells can be used as some sort of way to differentiate between strange Bigfoot and uh, and 
and uh, you know mundane Bigfoot, for lack of a better term. But it also sort of uh, brings a, a really good a, a really good question to my mind, which is so Mike Cleland has written ex- extensively on the prevalence of owls in UFO sightings, or rather that uh, abductees will run into owls. Um, sometimes the, the owls that they see just appear in sort of synchronistic ways. Sometimes they appear to be you know, directly used in a screen memory. Um, like, you know, I think there was an example that he likes to tell of a three foot tall owl that's standing in the middle of the road, looking over someone's, uh, someone's, you know, uh, the bonnet of their car. Um, but at the same time, Mike will not deny that there are flesh and blood owls that are absolutely mundane living creatures. So part of me wonders if perhaps we're not dealing with the reality of, of uh, you know, a flesh and blood ape-like Bigfoot whose imagery, whose depiction might sometimes be borrowed by a phenomena that's much stranger in a, in a way similar to what the way that the UFO phenomena seems, seems to borrow um, from – owl imagery um because i mean it's so so here's the frustrating thing about the bigfoot thing is that you can't if you're being intellectually honest you cannot ignore either side of the argument because there are plenty of cases where bigfoot disappears or people are following sasquatch footprints in the snow into a field and they just stop or where people see these glowing red eyes really high strange stuff that shouldn't belong to any biological uh, biological animal. And yet at the same time, on the other side, on the flip side of the argument, the, the pro biological Bigfoot argument, you will find people describing primate behavior. Uh, people who don't really have any interest or knowledge of primate behavior will actually describe primate behavior. Um, such as a pillow erection, the idea that hair stands up on its end. Uh, it's a common primatological thing. and something that some, some people have reported in Bigfoot encounters. Uh, a lot of, uh, Native American pageantry on totem poles and such um, feature uh, Sasquatch lips pursed in sort of a, a hooting configuration, which is obviously something very common to uh, to old world apes. Um, so, you, to, to, to the only the only way that I can reconcile these two things um, is to is to propose that perhaps there are. Uh, two things going on. One is a genuine cryptid, and the other one is something borrowing the countenance of that genuine cryptid for its own ends. And and you might see something like that too with the the big uh, spectral dog sightings, like some of these, or the big cat sightings, the alien cat sightings, where you might have some, you know, maybe someone had a tiger there or a lion that escaped from their personal zoo that no one knew about. Because, you know, they weren't supposed to have them. And other cases are actual paranormal appearances of these creatures. Yeah, I mean, I, I, think, it's, I think it's as good of, uh, of an explanation as anything. Um, yeah, absolutely. And now, you, you did do some, some work on the large dogs and the smells associated. Yes, um, you know, I've had a longstanding interest in the, uh, the black dog phenomenon, which is uh, large dogs, uh, sometimes the size the size of a of a small pony, um, that are traditionally seen at crossroads. Um, you'll find them under a variety of names in England, as you know, Black Shuck or uh, you know the the Bar Guest or you know different terms. But I'll I'll describe this black dog, this devil hound. Um, and surprise, surprise, often people will encounter these uh, black dogs and they'll smell like brimstone, they'll smell like sulfur. Um, and there was one case of a, of a person who uh, actually reached out to pet one of these spectral black dogs in, in old England and ended up putting their hand through a cloud of mist that smelled like, that smelled like sulfur. Now, I, I think the difference between, like, the Bigfoot and the dog encounters is this. We know dogs exist. Right. <laughs> we know what dogs smell like. So if yes. a dog smells like brimstone, we know that's weird. Whereas with a Bigfoot, if a Bigfoot exists as a flesh and blood creature that exists only here on Earth, uh, that doesn't, you know, isn't interdimensional or something, um, we don't actually know what they would smell like normally. So they could maybe smell like brimstone, and we just don't know because we have some encounters where they do and some encounters where they don't. Yeah, that's that's a great point. Um, it could also be that maybe the, maybe all Bigfoots are 
somehow not from this world, but some of them are more anchored in this world, and those are the ones that smell more fleshy and have the more flesh and blood sort of encounters than the ones that haven't quite materialized here fully. Who knows? I mean, yeah, I, I think that there's some validity to that. I mean, philosophically speaking, um, you know, there's been there's been a longstanding tradition that the nose can sort of pierce the veil of reality. In other words, uh, people don't believe their eyes; they believe their nose. You know, the nose knows <laughs> is a common <laughs> is a common saying, or we say that something doesn't pass the smell test, or something doesn't smell right. I mean, these all are sort of driving to the fact that your nose is able to intuitively tell you the nature of a situation more than your other senses. Um, so I think that sort of really dovetails nicely with what you, with what you said. And also, you have, uh, you know, people will, will report rocks being stone, thrown and things by Bigfoot, and you use a term that I really like called wilderness poltergeists, and that is really what it behaves like. People assume that even if they don't see a Bigfoot, if it does certain things, that it must be a Bigfoot. But if the same thing happened in a house, it would be a poltergeist. Yeah, I, I, I um, I'm fascinated by what the BFRO deems uh, Class B reports, which are reports where people uh, find peripheral activity in the forest and attribute it to Bigfoot. So you'll have a case where someone is camping and they smell this awful smell like rotten meat and they have these stones that are warm to the touch thrown at them and they'll hear strange voices and they'll say, oh, it must have been a Bigfoot. But... All that could be used to describe poltergeist phenomena as well. Um, yeah. I know it's interesting to me. Some people claim that uh, at habituation sites, Bigfoot will tap on walls and rap on walls, which, again, is another poltergeist thing. Yeah. Um, so I'm not – I'm not. I mean, before anybody gets upset, like I'm not suggesting that that is always the case. Um, but it does make me wonder if perhaps – you know, unless you see a Bigfoot throwing a rock – you can't be guaranteed that that's what threw the rock. So sometimes I wonder if perhaps just as human beings in certain circumstances can manifest a uh, can manifest a poltergeist uh, flap, if perhaps uh, a Sasquatch similarly couldn't be doing the same. So there, you know, there's there might be a Sasquatch in the area, but there just so happen to be manifesting poltergeist phenomena as well. <laughs> it's it's almost frustrating how all this stuff can bleed across from one thing to another because it, it makes you feel just kind of lost anytime you go, Well, but there's this. Oh wait, but then there's that. Yeah, well it's 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 like um I guess Russian nesting doll isn't a very good analogy, but it's definitely one of those situations where it, it becomes paralyzing in a way because there's so many different directions to take any one of these uh, any one of these ideas. Yeah, and they're contradictory to the other directions. Yeah, exactly. It, it, it's not like you can work work on both directions. It, it's like okay, so you're you're researching Bigfoot as a flesh and blood creature, and as you said, if you're going to be intellectually honest, you can't throw out the paranormal aspects, which don't make any sense to a flesh and blood creature in many cases. Exactly. Um, I mean, we're obviously missing something, is what it comes down to. <laughs> <laughs> um, but getting back to the dogs, you, uh, Betty Hill was telling a story about uh, someone she knew chasing a large dog. Was that it? Yeah, so there was a group of people who actually uh, ended up writing uh, a letter to uh, uh, Betty Hill. Um, they were looking for – there was basically UFO – they were sky watching for UFOs in Elliott, Maine in 1966. And they pulled into this gravel pit when they noticed this – a naturally large dog that ran past the car. Um, so everyone except for one individual, uh, well, they all hopped out of the car, but everyone except for one individual chased after this dog. The last person in line was stopped in his tracks by this strange odor. And uh, after a moment, he saw what looked like some sort of ominous robed figure in this gravel pit who he assumed was uh, producing the smell. And uh, he was, compelled to follow it as it glided away and apparently according to this particular uh, account he had to fight with all of his might to exert the willpower to not follow this figure um so a really odd story uh that uh, again is one of those stories where different phenomena blend um but uh i, I find it interesting because is it possible that the smell had some sort of effect on him you know was able to override his uh override his free will Somehow, uh, I think that's uh, very 
very uh, a very a very strongly implied by a story like that. And and I hadn't heard this story before, but what it makes me think of is in uh, a lot of the wilderness disappearances. It's usually the first person in a line of people that's like way ahead or the last person that's kind of lingering behind that ends up disappearing. Uh, in numerous cases that David Politis has, has put out there, uh, it, it it's, has always seemed to me like when the last time you see the person before, you know, the rest of the people walk around, they're kind of like focused on something, you know, looking off yeah. to the side. And I'm thinking, you know, you tell me this, you tell this uh, story and I'm thinking, are they smelling something? Is that what's drawing their attention initially? Is this... And, you know, would that person have been a missing 411 person at some point where they came back and they were just gone if they hadn't broke the, the spell and followed them? That's an excellent point, one that I hadn't really considered. But there is sort of a it, – it, it does – it is very evocative of the missing 411 stuff in terms of the way that uh, people were – you know, the stragglers are always the ones that are picked off. Yeah, and I mean, because it seems to me there needs to be something to, to distract them. It, it always seems like they're distracted by something. They're looking at something, and a smell would certainly draw them right to something. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's one thing to see a flick of light in the distance or something and go like, whoa, what was that? But if you smell something strong, you're going to stop. You're going to be like, whoa. Yeah, it's going to stop you. It's going to stop you in your tracks. I mean, I have plenty of cases that I ran into where people like, Basically, it was almost as if they were running into a wall of stench, you know, um, in the woods. And that's when, right before they saw a, a Sasquatch staring at them. Yeah. Um, you also cover, you, as we talked about already, you cover some of the weird stuff that, that has odors to it, like star jelly, which uh, I had something like this land on my car once, and I had no idea what it was. I didn't smell it, so I didn't. Uh, I don't. I don't know what it smelled like. But this was kind of a jelly formation that fell on my windshield during. I, I believe it was like an on and off sort of rainy type of period, and it, the windshield wipers didn't want to move it at all. It just left stains, and eventually, I think the rain, of, you know, wore it away and it went away. Uh, but you tell people a little bit about this. Yeah, it's it's one of the things that people I don't think really talk about that much. Um, but it's uh, pidreth ser was the term in Welsh, um, which means star rot, and it's this idea that uh, uh, this jelly falls to earth from time to time, uh, very much tied into concepts of fourteen falls from the sky, like rains of blood or rains of frogs or you know nails or whatever. Um, but uh, this is a, uh, I mean, relatively common phenomena uh, throughout time, where these giant globs of stinky, smelly, uh, gelatinous material will fall to earth. Um, in modern years, people have suggested that perhaps this is frozen and thawed airline toilet waste, which I kind of have a hard time buying, yeah. or vulture vomit, which I have a hard time buying too. Um, but there have been some cases, especially in the uh, 19th century, where individuals, uh, scientists, uh, have a claim to have actually harvested some of this star jelly. And in almost every case, um, it was, you know, this overpowering, suffocating smell that, in, you know, induces nausea and vomiting in people and just this awful, awful odor. Um, in more modern years, uh, it was about uh, a little bit over 30 years ago. Uh, two ladies uh, were driving in Michigan, and around 3 a.m., their car stalled, and they noticed that this brown slime was falling from the sky, and they said that it had this smell that was very similar to rotten eggs. Again, we see this hydrogen sulfide description re uh, rearing its head again. And it may be something totally natural that causes it. I mean, when it happened to me, I thought it was weird, but I wasn't thinking supernatural. It was just kind of like, what the hell just fell on my car? Oh, to the contrary. Like, I, I mean, or not to the contrary, but uh, to, to agree with you, I, I suspect that this is probably some sort of uh, phenomena that sort of falls into the realm of the preternatural. In other words, it's uh, something that is entirely explainable by uh, natural no mechanisms, science. but we just yeah, but we yeah. just haven't gotten around to to studying it in depth yet. Because it doesn't happen enough, I think is part of the problem there. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. Um, yeah. You you also deal with chupacabras and their smell. El chupacabras, yeah. Um, so in case anyone doesn't know, um, chupacabras are a phenomena that uh, el chupacabras are a phenomena that really reared its head for the first time in uh, the mid nineties. 
in Puerto Rico. Uh, farmers said that their livestock were being exsanguinated by this short little entity with a large head and large almond-shaped dark eyes and uh, a row of spines down its back, and it would hop around, and it was sucking the blood from all their, all their livestock. Um, uh, in some cases, people said that the uh, kill sites of El Chupacabras uh, left behind a smell like, guess what, brimstone. <laughs> Again, <laughs> um, granted, there are other people who claimed to have uh, encountered Chupacabras that smelled like battery acid or paint thinner, um, but sulfur was a very common a very common scent that clung not only to uh, the entities themselves, but also their kill sites. Uh, there was one woman who claimed that uh, any, she could always tell if a chupacabra was around because she could smell it, and then she knew that you know that was the that was the sign. Um, I'm a little bit dubious as to uh, a livestock kill that smells like hydrogen sulfide not having something more to do with decomposition. I mean, when when we die, when anything dies, um, it releases a couple of different component compounds uh cadaverine and putrescine are two uh compounds that have that rotten corpse odor but also a variety of uh of sulfur compounds as well i mean you've got uh you've got hydrogen sulfide as we mentioned earlier but also you know methanethyl dimethyl sul- di- dimethyl disulfide dimethyl trisulfide i mean a lot of different sulfur components um uh you'll find in these uh, decomposition smells so Maybe that has something to do with the entity. Maybe it doesn't. Um, I do think it's interesting, though, you know, returning to this idea of decomposition. Um, we are so sensitive to the smell of sulfur in general. I mean, if, if you were to take an ink dropper and to drop it into a semi-truck trailer full of water, that would be twice the concentration at which we can detect hydrogen sulfide. We can detect hydrogen sulfide at 0.47 parts per billion. Um, so we're extremely sensitive uh, to this to this odor. And uh, even when we don't realize it, um, a certain, a, a lot of things that we think smell badly, smell badly because of an underlying sulfur component. I mean, um, you know, there was a case uh, in a 1979 UFO sighting from Massachusetts where the witness said the UFO smelled like skunk spray. Well, one of the main malodorants in skunk spray are thiols. They're sulfur compounds. Um, you know, another witness said that the uh, UFO smelled like um, smelled like household gas. Well, household gas doesn't have an odor. People add uh, mercaptans to household gas to provide an olfactory warning as to gas leaks. Mercaptans are sulfurous. So you find a lot of these encounters where people don't even think about something having to do with sulfur. Um, they're actually describing something that whose, whose main component of, of being smelly is, is, is sulfur. <laughs> um, and you didn't tackle cattle mutilations. Yeah. You know, um, cattle mutilations are, I feel like so I had to draw the line somewhere, right? And <laughs> and uh, and cattle mutilations to me just seemed like they would be a little bit too much of a of a uh, of, of a rabbit hole for me to fall down. Um, plus, I mean, I think when you, as I mentioned with the with the uh, livestock mutilations involving the chupacabras, uh, you'll find that I mean. I feel like it would be too easy to start mixing up the smell of the decaying corpse versus the smell of an entity that might have left something behind. So I did draw a line there at that. Um, but having said that, you know, there are plenty of cases that I've I've encountered, or at least a handful of cases that I've encountered, where uh, some sort of medicinal or chemical smell was left behind at a cattle mutilation site. Again, it's something I just didn't go into because I feel like um, there's some really good literature out there that probably does a better job of covering that sort of angle of the topic than I uh, than I ever could. Um, but yeah, I didn't didn't go into the cattle mutilation thing in this one, not this time around. Well, Christopher O'Brien seems to have written the the penultimate uh, book on cattle mutilations. It'd be hard for for too much to be added to a little short of a breakthrough at this point. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Uh, stalking the herd. Yeah. It's a. It's a. It's yeah. I, that's that's one of the reasons I didn't do it is because I'm like I don't know what I would say that Chris hasn't already. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about the Dog Man. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, so. 
in case <laughs> Dogman's all the rage nowadays, but in case yeah. someone in case someone doesn't know what it is, um, sightings often in the upper Midwest, but a little bit of everywhere nowadays it seems like um, of uh, this basically this bipedal creature, you know, muscular with a, a dog's head. Basically, imagine Sasquatch with a the dog's head um, and claws. Uh, there are a couple of encounters where Sasquatch, or Sasquatch, now you know it, where Dogman has been sighted, uh, and he's had an awful, awful smell. Um, for example, there was a 1936 case from Racine, Wisconsin, where a man, uh, saw this Dogman creature skulking about some, uh, Native American burial grounds. And, uh, it was, he said that it ended up smelling like long dead meat. So again, this, these, uh, these concepts of, uh, of foul smells of decomposition and decay and rot. I mean, really, you look at a lot of these these smells, and they're all smells of entropy. You know, um, you have burning smells, you have uh, decaying smells, you have uh, rotten smells. Like th- these are all smells that sort of are you would expect to run into um, with the uh, the breakdown of matter into you know into its constituent elements. Well, maybe these things are, are projecting into our reality in a way that they immediately start breaking down. And that's where the smell comes from. That's an interesting angle that I hadn't ever really considered, but uh, I should have I should have conferred <laughs> with you on this, Raya. Because, um, I mean, we don't know, you know if, they, if they're here long term. I mean, these things just seem to vanish. So maybe part of the reason they vanish is they're projecting into our reality from wherever. Uh, whether it be another dimension or even another planet or another uh, another frequency of matter, and they just can't sustain it, so they immediately start decaying. I mean, yeah, that that's that's a great point. I mean, and it's sort of it sort of uh, dovetails with, in an oblique way, some of John Keel's ideas. Keel felt that perhaps uh, the act of entering into our realm, um, the act of entering into our realm. Might how so, might somehow generate um, smells of of hydrogen sulfide, which isn't quite exactly what you're talking about, but it, you know, is a a little bit of it. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So that, that that's that's not a bad suggestion at all. And uh, speaking of uh, Keel, uh, let's talk a little bit about the Men in Black and their smells as well as well as uh, Black Eyed Kids. Yeah, yeah. Um, so you'll find. It's almost becoming a, tro- a, a trope now at this point. Yes, men in black smell like sulfur too. <laughs> black eyed kids smell like sulfur too. Um, but uh, yeah, there's there is a uh, no, no shortage of cases where um, people will notice uh, a foul like burning smell um, from men in black that will uh, actually give witnesses a headache. Um, there uh, sometimes they smell like uh, formaldehyde. Uh, that you'll you'll find cases of a varying description like that um, in the literature. It's interesting because one of the very first Men in Black cases, um, the first appearances of the Men in Black, was um, by Albert Bender, who was uh, founder of the International Flying Saucer Bureau, and I believe Bender was living with his mom and dad, and he was keeping his IFSB uh, files in their attic, and he had returned home from the cinema, uh, an experience where I believe he felt like he was being followed all the way back home and he gets to the top of the stairs and there's a light coming in from the attic from underneath the attic door. He opens it up and he goes inside and his files are disturbed and he notices like this bright light that sort of just fades away and he's hit with this, with this smell of burning sulfur. And this sort of kicked off uh, the first set of regular visits that he would have with the MIB three men in black who he said always were accompanied by a strong odor of sulfur or decomposing eggs. Um, so yeah, the men in black smells are, are a common thing too. Again, that sulfur smell, um, thinking to black eyed kids, which have a lot in common with men in black actually, yeah. you know, appearing on your doorstep and asking you to come in being awkward socially. Um, people will claim that they smell not only like the grave, so earth, um, decay, but you also uh, find people claiming that the uh, black-eyed kids smell, again, like sulfur. Um, not in a ton of cases. I believe that David Weatherly said it was like maybe 
somewhere around 25 or 30 percent of the cases that he had encountered. But uh, that's still that's still a significant enough number, I would think. Yeah, yeah. All right, let, let, let's jump into a little bit of your speculation at the end. Um, the the first thing is uh, the idea of suspended animation that can be caused by different uh, chemicals. Right. Um, so in trying to <laughs> the the cases where smell is noticed in paranormal encounters fall into one of two categories. Um, either, you know, sulfur smells almost exclusively hydrogen sulfide. Um, because I think a lot of times when people say sulfur, they probably mean hydrogen sulfide, that rotten egg smell. Right. So sulfur smells and not sulfur smells. Um, but what do we make of the prevalence of, of sulfur smells, this plurality of cases that involve sulfur smells? Well, um, about I think it was about a little bit over a decade ago, uh, a gen- I, uh, researchers from the University of Washington declared that they had created a state of suspended animation in mice utilizing nothing other than hydrogen sulfide. Now, I mentioned earlier how sensitive we are to hydrogen sulfide. The reason we're so sensitive is because uh, it's actually quite dangerous. It was used as a, uh, a chemical uh, warfare agent in World War I. So hydrogen sulfide can, can kill you, can be nasty stuff. Um, but in this particular case, they were able to monitor, specifically monitor amounts of hydrogen sulfide administered to these mice. And when they did this, they were actually able to basically lower the metabolism of these mice a ridiculous amount. I mean, um, so they were able to, they were put into the state for six hours and they, uh, the mice took 10 breaths per minute. Uh, their baseline had been 120 breaths per minute, and their body temperature plummeted to 51.8 degrees Fahrenheit, um, which is shocking. I mean, essentially, these things were made to be cold-blooded. Um, so uh, they were, uh, as of, you know, 11 years ago, they were pushing ahead with human trials. Not a lot has been made on that front in terms of headway that I've heard. Um, but it's really fascinating that the most common paranormal smell has the possibility to put mammals into an altered state. Now I'm not saying that hydrogen sulfide is hallucinogenic, but what I am saying is that it doesn't take much imagination to perceive a state of light suspended animation or even a fully immersed suspended animation state having a similar, uh, a similar experience as hypnagogic states or hypnopompic states. Um, it seems to me like there's the potential for a suspended animation scenario to sort of set the stage for an other intelligence to interact with, with people, um, basically slipping them into this sort of light suspended animation so that they're in basically an altered state of sorts. You, and you, uh, you, you, yeah, your your theory around that, like they could be, you, you point out that you get the sort of suspended state sort of smells at the beginning of some encounters, and near the end you get the type of smells that are, uh, is it trigeminal stimulation? Yeah. So, uh, so this is this isn't a great. Uh, this is sort of a half-formed hypothesis at this point, right? Because we only have like the, the, the one set of smells. So how do we explain the rest of the smells? Is there any sort of commonality to the outliers? And uh, I was able to discover that uh, there sort of is a, a shared commonality. So uh, one of the largest nerves in our faces is the trigeminal nerve. It's what is responsible for giving us sensations of hot, spicy foods or, uh, or cool, like minty foods. And, uh, Anyone who wants to sort of see what uh, their trigeminal nerve feels like should uh, just open up a, a bottle of vinegar and take a big old whiff through your nose. And that sort of stinging, uh, pungent sensation, because that's the actual definition of pungent, is that uh, that irritating sensation. That's your trigeminal nerve being stimulated. And if you look at the list of of smells of odors that are strong trigeminal stimulants. It reads like a laundry list of, of the smells from the book. So camphor, ammonia, uh, benzenes, um, uh, certain aldehydes, um, uh, cinnamon, which we didn't really talk about, but, uh, 
uh, ozone, like a lot of these different things are are uh, trigeminal stimulants. I mean, if you look at the odor of onions, that's a trigeminal stimulant too because you get watery eyes. Um, and uh, so what's interesting about this is that trigeminal stimulants or trigeminal stimulation rather is the mechanism by which uh, by which smelling salts work to rouse people from unconsciousness. And that's when sort of this 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 hypo hypothesis comes together a little bit is that you have two categories of smells, right? The hydrogen sulfide smells um, and the trigeminal stimulants. Also, sulfur dioxide, which is that gunpowder smell, is a trigeminal stimulant as well. So you have hydrogen sulfide smells and other smells. Of these two categories, hydrogen sulfide can put people into an unconscious state, or rather a uh, a a state of diminished consciousness and the other smells the trigeminal stimulants have the ability to rouse people from uh, unconsciousness so they're set at two ends of a spectrum so the hypothesis becomes that perhaps by means unknown and intelligence um, can implement and slip an individual into a light trance of sorts with uh, hydrogen sulfide uh, interact with the witness um, and then in order to either uh, accelerate their recovery or to fully initiate the recovery, administer a trigeminal stimulant, perhaps one that has some sort of intimate uh, connection for the witness, some sort of, some sort of a scent that might call back uh, a memory or invoke some sort of reaction. Um, depending on where someone is paying attention, they might notice the... Uh, they might notice the hydrogen sulfide smell, or if they're paying more attention after the fact, they might uh, they might actually notice the trigeminal stimulant as you know after the fact and when they recall their their sighting. And one of the things you talk about, which I didn't, I don't think I fully realized, is that uh, I mean we all know about missing time and UFO encounters, but people who have Bigfoot and other encounters also experience some time dilation as well. You were you were saying? Yeah, I mean so. Uh, there's a there's a podcast that I actually do enjoy, but it's a very popular Sasquatch uh, podcast, and uh, the podcast has historically a a strong reputation as dismissing people who would dare suggest that Sasquatch is anything but a flesh and blood creature, um, and uh, I found this incredibly ironic because the podcast, which was started by someone who had actually had their own sighting. Uh, said that, uh, yeah, when I was up there in the car watching these things that were surrounding our car, it felt like it was about 40 minutes max, but I got back and I checked the clock and it had been four hours. And I'm just like, are you kidding me? That is straight up a missing time event. Yeah. And it's Sasquatch sighting. Um, you know, to a lesser degree, you'll have people say that time slows down when they're staring in a Sasquatch. Um, but this is, you know, missing time is, is definitely a common, uh, a common theme in alien abduction cases. It's also uh, something that you sort of is alluded to in sleep paralysis cases where people feel like time slows down and it feels like yeah. forever. Um, so I can't well, it's, help but, it's, sorry, it, suggests, it suggests an altered state as well. It does. It does. And I can't help but think that um, I can't help but suspect that if you were in a state of suspended animation, your interpretation of time would change. And yeah. coincidentally enough, this uh, suspended animation concept, um, you know, would also handily explain why so many different uh, paranormal witnesses claim that they're paralyzed during the encounter. It's, it's, it's a great theory. I mean, it doesn't explain anything, everything by any means, but it seems like it, it could be a piece, a very well, small piece of a bigger puzzle. Yeah, it's it's not perfect because there are plenty of cases where people don't notice a smell at all in any of these cases. Um, well, so it could, you know, it, it could just be how these things approach people in different ways. Different, there could be multitudes of different ways that people interact with this phenomena. Yes, exactly. I mean, I think maybe maybe some of it's like the hypothesis from a Trojan feast, and maybe some of it's like the hypothesis from the brimstone deceit. You know? Yeah. Um. And you have a, a chapter at the end on alchemy, which is pretty interesting as well. Yeah, that's that's um, you know, I 
I, I feel like you have to address alchemy when talking about this, but it was one of those things where I'm like, come on, guys, just give me like three pages to get you up to speed, <laughs> crash course in alchemy. Because it's not something that you can just jump right into. But yeah, the reason that you have to talk about it is because um, in alchemical philosophy, uh, it was um, it was the, the, the primary constituents of all matter were uh, salt, mercury, and sulfur. Um, originally taken literally and then, you know, sort of, uh, reinterpreted as sort of a philosophical version of those particular elements. But, um, it's, um, interesting, like, you know, Mercury represented the, uh, more stereotypically feminine, subdued, creative, submissive aspect of creation. And sulfur was the, uh, the fiery, passionate, masculine, um, dominating sort of aspect of, uh, of, 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 of reality. All right. Well, you know what? I mean, pe people might think I'm biased because you are essentially a co-host on this show, but this book is excellent. And I do not say that because, <laughs> you know, you're, you're on this show. I, I, it was an exceptional read. You pull up so much stuff that I don't think anyone has ever touched on before. And for anyone who missed it, the book is called The Brimstone Deceit, an in-depth examination of supernatural sense, otherworldly odors, and monstrous miasmas. I really appreciate the kind words, Soraya. Um, you know, They're honest is... words. <laughs> well, I appreciate it. It's, it's sort, of, um, sort of the niche that I was... I hoped to carve out for myself after a Trojan feast is looking at things that might have been the focus of a chapter here and there throughout the literature, but things that had never really gotten the true uh, full length book length treatment um, that they deserve. So the food taboo thing was one of them. And uh, the smell uh, aspect is something that, you know, here's a new thing because I, I think that, People have spent so much time trying to solve the big mysteries. What are UFOs? Is Sasquatch real? You know, are, do the spirits of the dead return to Earth? That they forget to, um, they forget the possibility that uh, some sort of tiny detail that we might perceive as insignificant might actually, uh, upon further examination, give us some deeper insight into the phenomena. Yeah, and I th and I think you you do, I really do. Uh, it, it's not it's not going to explain it all, but it's giving us some more insight that no one has picked up before. Uh, the book is on Anomalist Books, which is a great book company, by the way. They publish many good things, including both of your books, and it's available pretty much everywhere, right? Yes, um, Amazon and Barnes & Noble. Uh, the formats as of right now are paperback, uh, Kindle, ebook and something called a Kobo. I think there's another, I think there's another e-reader format as well. Uh, but pretty much uh, pick your poison. Nice. All right. And people can find you online where? At jo well, here at Where Did the Road Go? Um, of course. But also uh, joshuacutchin.com. I have a blog there and I keep track of all my radio interview appearances. All right. Thanks so much, Josh. Yeah, you're welcome. It's a pleasure as always, Soraya.